Okay, so we've come to the end of our second masterclass where we've looked about concurrence. We've looked at concurrence and we're now going to have a short you know, discussion around concurrency. And so, Joe, I mean, what's unique about the Erlang style concurrency as it's been coined? I think it's that it's probably the first language that really implemented an agent model. I mean, it consists of lots of small processes with no shared memory that communicate through message passing. So it's actually, it's an object model with, with, with messaging, but it's a proper object model with, with messaging. And that essentially decouples the sender from the receiver, and there's no shared memory. So, so kind of things with mutexes and releasing mutexes and things like that go away. And it also behaves the same on all different operating systems, because it's, it's not using the concurrency model of the underlying operating system and uh, that makes it very powerful. So what you see are the major advantages you know, towards concurrency models in languages which have shared memory? Uh, I think it allows you to build systems out of small communicating components. So, so if, if you don't get that isolation between the components, the systems tend to become very, very big and, and they kind of are very tightly coupled. But, but the way you design things in Erlang should be from, from a lot of small, loosely coupled components with well-defined protocols in between them. And that makes it easy to reason about them and easy to debug them. Because, I mean, from the point of view, from the point where you've got a message into a process to where you get it out, it's purely functional. Or, mm. or you can write it in that way. Sure. Uh, and uh, if, if you're careful, you can write most of the system without any side effects, apart from this message passing side effect mm. that you get at the boundary of a process. Yeah. That makes it very easy to reason about it. I mean, certainly our students find Java threading very complicated. Oh, it's a, you know, they start yeah. to write GUIs and it's, you know, they... Their, their mental picture of what's going on when they do a Java program is very is very hazy, yeah. I think. I Whereas I think with Erlang, it's a yes. very clear mental model of what's of these separate processes. Right, and I, and I think modeling this the world. principle of observational equivalence, mm. you know, two two systems are equivalent if they're observationally equivalent, is, is yes. a very strong and principle. So, very so, strong. so, yes, so if, if you've got this black box, you send a message in, and you observe a message out, and it's the wrong message, you know it, you know it's something that's wrong inside. Yeah. When did links come into picture and the whole concept of error handling as I've not seen it in any other it, programming it language? It came in very early. Well, very early. I say we, we experimented with lots of different versions. Was of, it uh, Mike like who came up with that? Mike yeah. came up yeah. with the idea of links, yes. And, and it was uh, it actually was to solve a, a, a different problem. That was the problem of, of zombie processes when mm. things go wrong. Because exactly. yeah. if, if you have lots of processes who are coordinating a computation exactly. and one of them fails, quite often it's meaningless to continue. In fact, there are two mechanisms, the links and monitors, and they're actually mm. used for different purposes. Yes. Links should be used to collapse whole collections yeah, whole of processes yeah. that are collaborating. Yeah, yeah. Monitors should be used for an asymmetric. Mm. I mean, if, 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 if you've got a server with thousands of clients, you don't want to crash. Uh, let me see, if one of the clients crashed, you don't want to crash the server mm. because uh, it would affect all the clients. But mm. if the server crashes, of course, all the clients you do want to crash. It's very mm. asymmetric. But if you've got three or four processes linked together without a client, you know, in a peer-to-peer -peer system, then you may want to crash that, that little graph of mm. processes. Yeah. So you can set these up independently. And that's very nicely designed, I think, that, the, the way that fits in with communication and so on, yes. and the way you yeah. can halt that. Yeah. It's interesting if you look at, at, I know the people who did work on extending Occam with, with, with uh, dynamic process spawn and so on, found that very difficult. I mean, yes. they found, and I, and they I had a notion of poison, but it was, it was rather ad hoc, and right. it was clearly not, it's, it was bolted on to, to a language. And, and it was very important for me to, to, to try and make it work the same way in a distributed system as in a, a uniprocessor system. Just right. for the, because I want to debug it and test it on one system, I want it to behave in the same way. Mm. You know, I hate these things where you've, you've got to program it one way uh, if it's on one processor, yeah. and a completely different way if it's distributed. Yeah. I want to program it the same way on both. Yeah, it, it, it took me a while to actually realize the importance of um, the asynchronous propagation channels for error messages. Because you know what's running on one node, as it's asynchronous communication, can easily be distributed in a cluster of nodes, and you can actually use the same mechanisms in your distribution as you're doing locally. Yeah. The I only, mean, this is, the I, only uh, deltas you've got a I, network I, in between. I, I used and, to, before yeah. I did this work, I used to be a physicist, and so mm. you know this, you know, these computer scientists who say you can do synchronous communication, you're breaking laws of physics. You yeah. can't. It's yeah. rays of light, yeah. and, and and there is yeah, differential there is. information in the system. I, I guess there are some disadvantages of, of asynchronous. Communication in Erlang. I mean, you can have mailboxes that there that are, grow, yes, yes, yes. Um, yes, you have to be aware of that. and I guess that raises a general question, which which seems to be. I mean, I, but I, synchronous I, things, you will break the laws of physics oh, to no, do it. Of course, so, yeah. so you can't. That's, you know, breaking laws of physics is that's a good that's, challenge. No, no, that's yeah. no, no, that's <laughs> no, no. So, so Simon, before you started teaching Erlang here at the university, what were you using to? 
teach concurrency to the students? Well, uh, Kent has a long history of working with Occam. So we were teaching Occam and we were teaching Occam Pi, mm -hmm. uh, which is a dynamic version of Occam. So we were teaching something similar. We were teaching um, separate processes. But of course, Occam has a different model in that right. there are channels, yeah. explicit channels, um, and, and there are certainly advantages in that, where you have, you can look at an Occam program and you can see, here's a process, here's a channel. Whereas in Erlang, it's, it's yes. rather more Because we were playing structure. with the transputer uh, yes. uh, when, yeah. we, when we developed um, Erlang, so, so but certainly aware of Occam. Yes. Yeah. But like I guess the folding editor. The, oh, well, I think that was one of the things that put people, a lot of people off. Oh, that was a great um, thing. But it, some liked it and some didn't. Um, like. But I think one of the problems there was it, it didn't it didn't really get traction, um, and it, it's also got this this uh, um, imperative model in each process, which is you know, slightly. It, it also had some weird fairness. I mean, the transputer had some funny things about fairness because if you had a re what in Erlang terms would be a receive statement with multiple yes. branches, the one at the bottom quite often wasn't fairly scheduled. Yes, and, yeah. and if, if they were all equal. But, uh, yeah. And I think I suppose also the problem there was tying a language to an implementation that you know yeah. you could you can run Occam not on the transputer and you can run other languages on the transputer yes. but they were very tightly coupled yeah. so I, I think I think possibly too yeah. early as yeah. well I think our students like I mean yes. uh, we talk so we we've been teaching message, message passing concurrency here for 25 years mm. so in that sense I think it's one of the foundations of um, computer science yeah. Yeah. yeah but lots of places don't yeah but I suppose well, what's, that's nice, worrying. what's yeah. nice about Erlang is that we can teach functional programming and uh, communicating process based concurrency yeah. in one language and that, that's a win. So you teach shared memory processing as well? Well, we teach it, they learn Java. Oh dear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let, let's, I, I have another question here. Now, the whole embedded space has always been a very sequential affair. How do you see, well, looking at you know, C, you, you, you know, using C you know, to, to, to implement um, not our embedded. No, no, no. The no, Ericsson it, embedded it, stuff well, has been highly concurrent. Though. But where, where does Air, the Erlang come in and fit into the whole embedded space? It fits in very nicely, actually. I mean, what, what, Erlang is actually quite an old language, so it's developed in, in um, about, well, it started in about 1985. And the first implementations were running on machines with, with well under a megabyte of memory. So, yeah, so I mean, the, the, the virtual machine. So you machine, can take the virtual machine. Yeah, machines I mean, the virtual machine is, is quite tiny now. Now yes. it's become yeah. slightly more bloated with time. Mm -hmm. um, but but you can get a good Erlang system in five megabytes quite right. easily. And so we're we're I mean, at Ericsson. We're running it. We're running it on uh, ARM nine processors and, and doing embedded applications. Oh, interesting. And, uh, yeah. I mean, there is RAM running on Raspberry Pis, there's RAM yes. running on the Parallela board, yeah. on Beagle boards. Yeah. So we're doing it in anger yeah. in Ericsson. Yeah. So, so. In, in product, is that? Yes, oh, actually. Right. Yes. Yeah. I'm not supposed to talk about these okay. at the moment. but Potential we'll, product. Yeah, things, no, things no. I mean, it's, it, it's yeah. very nice. It's very nice. Yeah. It, oh, it fits onto the, 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 the ARM processors very nicely. Mm -hmm. So we run it on the quad core ARM nine process, and you're getting you're using the concurrency there. Absolutely, the absolutely. Yes. Yeah. In fact, we don't use one. Layer. I mean, we we do this uh, what we talked about earlier. The the products we make are run on ARM nines, and it's uh, we actually use two Erlang. I mean, we use Erlang and C. So we mm. use C for the stuff that has to be performant, so and we use Erlang for the control stuff. Yeah, that's um, that makes and, perfect and we mix sense. the two. Yeah. What is the question of Erlang and speed? If you look at my laptop, I'm able to spawn off about 10 million processes, send a message to them, have them receive the message, and then terminate them in a few seconds. Yes. Why are people complaining about speed? Uh, well, the people who don't use Erlang are complaining about speed because they perceive it to be slow. Mm. And that's a sequential code they're yes. thinking of. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. If, if you do a compression algorithm or cryptography in Erlang, it will be slower. But if you, d if you do this handling multiple concurrency, it, will be, it should be faster. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. our experience. Yeah, in, I mean, that's why, that's why WhatsApp yeah. and people like that choose Erlang, because, mm, yeah. because it's, you know, it's really, it, that's where it excels. I mean, it was designed for telephone exchanges which, which have hundreds of thousands of simultaneous connections in mm. them. And they're typically, you know, a packet comes in, do something very quickly, then go to sleep for a potentially very long time and then do it again. So, mm. so there's no notion of storing state in a database when you're not doing something. You know, concurrency isn't sort of do something, put your state in a database, go to sleep. Mm. You know, so you, sure. you avoid all this mismatch of oh, putting, yeah, st putting stuff in yeah. and out of a database. It models, it, it, it fits with the, yes. with the world it's yes. modeling. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you for listening and we're ready now for the next masterclass. Mm.